this all kind of starts back in 2016 through March of 2017. David had told his parents late in 2016 that he planned to hike the PCT. Uh, as you can imagine, his parents were not too thrilled about hearing this. Obviously, he has no experience really in hiking, um, but he basically had already started training by the time he told them. Uh, he trained, obviously, in Ireland, but nothing there could prepare him for, you know, alpine hiking, especially hiking with snow, using crampons, microspikes, etc. cetera. Um, and it was uh, unfortunate that David, when he got his permit, he got an early season start on March 22nd, 2017. This basically ensured that he was going to encounter some snow on the trail, and sure enough, he does. Um, and they do this for the PCT to minimize the environmental impact of thousands of hikers, you know, going down this trail. So they don't allow more than 50 hikers per day to start at the southern end of the trail because that is the most popular way to hike it is to go south to north. Um, and yeah, you wouldn't want to end in the desert. And if you look at, like. if you go to that uh, PacificCrestTrail.org website, you don't have to, Joe, but I'm just saying it I'm to the listeners. Um, you can see on the, the, they have a chart of how many uh, hikers have done the PCT over the last 10, 20 years. And right around when that movie Wild came out, uh, th the kind of number of people that were trying the PCT exploded. And this also coincided with, um, rescue missions <laughs> no uh there was a year-long drought so oh, the pct hikers who had been um reporting on the internet of conditions of their trips in recent years it was over a year-long drought um reported that it was very dry not a lot of snow and david when he was preparing and training for the the hike used the a lot of these reports and assumed that it was uh going to be pretty dry and the drought actually ended uh, in 2017, so he encountered a lot more moisture, rain, and snow on his hike. And you'll see in the emails that he sent back to his family that he wasn't expecting this. So um, kind of an interesting um, you know, tidbit of you, you can do all the research, and then um, you think it's going to be dry, and then the year you go, the drought ends, and it, the conditions completely change. Um, so, and David actually knew that the Sierra Nevada section had received heavy snowfall and that he wasn't equipped for it. So he planned a strategy that through hikers call flip-flopping. Uh, this is skipping over the Sierra portion of the trail initially, then returning later when enough ice and snow is melted for him to feel safe passing it. That's smart. Yeah. So he had planned to do that, but um, we'll, we'll see that he probably didn't. So uh, it's now March 20th of 2017. David left Ireland for the PCT. He arrives uh, for the first day of the hike on March 22nd. Oh, you've got the chart up now. Yeah, of, uh, yeah. it shows so far, 2022, only three people have completed. Well, I, uh, I guess. Ravioli, Black Squatch. <laughs> <laughs> That's his trail name. Is oh, those are the trail names. Yeah, Black, Swa Black Squatch. Yeah, what's up, and Cat Mando. Cat Mando. Yeah. Um, this is really cool. They break it down by year by how many people completed. What are some of the other trail names? I'm, I'm just going to name any off. Any of, oh, ones. Let's see here. There's a lot. <laughs> this one's just Eric. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, Any other good ones? Orca. Sugar Free. Sugar Free. Oh, that's definitely got a story. Fat Peanut. <laughs> Bird Person. Bird Person. Uh, crunchy bean. Now you remember, everyone listen. You got to be given a trail name. Yeah, you can't make these up. So you this can't. is like something about the caboost. <laughs> All right. Well, speed goat. Speed goat. <laughs> so okay. Uh, so he starts the his PCT hike on March twenty second of twenty seventeen. Like we said, he started from Campo, California. He planned to hike the entire PCT from the border up to Canada. David was one of almost 4,000 people who got permits from the Pacific Crest Trail Association to hike the entire route in 2017. The association is a nonprofit that helps maintain the trail, provides information, and issues long-distance permits, but does not keep track of hikers along the way or take responsibility for their safety. 
So David wrote uh, in this first day an email to his dad. You'll We've got a pretty detailed timeline of most of the days before he goes missing through emails that he sent back to his parents. Uh, in an email to his dad, he wrote, when I got... Uh, when I got the bus into Campos or Campo on the first day, there was only two other hikers. We ended up splitting up in Campo and I haven't seen either of them since I hiked about six miles of the first day since I didn't reach Campo until about two o'clock. I passed two tents along the way. There were meant to be 50 people starting that day. So it is now March 23rd, 2017. This is the second day of his hike. In another email to uh, his dad, David wrote, I passed two other hikers on day two. The first was only hiking to Mount Laguna, about 40 miles in, and she seemed to want to go on with it, so I didn't talk to her much. The other hiker was telling me about alternative routes to Idlewild, but I haven't memorized everywhere I'm going. I didn't know where Idlewild was at the time. Um. So we are now on March 24th of 2017. It is the third day of his hike. He writes, Day three was more genuine desert. Cacti, lizards, and sand everywhere. I was starting to feel slow on day three. I only made it about 12 miles when I had planned to hike 16. I didn't see anyone hiking on the trail. The only people I saw during the day were a couple of hunters, one carrying a beer (laughs) and the other carrying a rifle. Maybe don't tell mom that part. (laughs) So now it is March 24th, 2017. It's that night. He was still looking for Idlewild. I have it pulled up here for people watching. I don't think he was looking for it. He just didn't know where it was at the time. Okay. Um, So by the third night, David met another PCT hiker who had gotten as far in two days as he hiked in three. He writes, the more I talked to her, the more I realized my bag was too heavy. I got my kilos and pounds mixed up when I was measuring it, he wrote to his dad. (laughs) So he pa- he overpacked and he didn't he didn't make the the pounds to kilos measurement. So it is now March twenty fifth of twenty seventeen, which would be the fourth day of his hike. Uh, David reached Mount Laguna elevation about six thousand feet, where he got help uh, lightening his load at an outfitter. He dumped some items and replaced other equipment, including his tent, with a lighter version. Every ounce counts when you have to carry it twenty six hundred miles. He wrote. So. Um, you're pulling up Mount Laguna. Yeah, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. Uh, so now we're we're gonna. So he was at an outfitter up here. Uh, it just said that he. Yeah, it looks like there's buildings and stuff. Uh, maybe it it didn't specify. Um, he said he he reached Mount Laguna elevation about six thousand feet where he got help lightening his load at an outfitter. All right. So maybe uh, there's an outfitter down there. Yes. What is that? I don't know. Secret government facility, maybe? <laughs> is that the PCT? Yeah, this is Mount Laguna. Yeah. I'm trying to see if they'll give me street view. Uh, I can't get up no. to where that building is. Oh, so they have street view on the PCT. Yeah. That's cool. Remember Google had those backpacks people were doing trails with? Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's a road, though. Yeah, this is a road. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's now March 26th uh, through March 28th. This would be the fifth through seventh day. Uh, After dropping about 12 pounds of gear, David writes, I've been flying ever since uh, in an email to his dad. He covered about 35 miles in three days before stopping in the town of Julian, about five miles off the trail, he said. He he wrote, I think I can do at least 18 a day now without pushing myself too hard. So, Joe, what did you say that some of the elite hikers, they do 30 in a day? 30 a day for... Two or three months. So they're almost doubling up his pace at 18, which is yeah. pretty aggressive for someone who's a novice. Yeah. Um, so you got Julian pulled up. Yeah, you know what I've heard too? Um, and there was a guy who did a, like a marathon a day around the UK. I think I heard it on a Rogan episode. But it was somebody who had, it was kind of like one of those people who had no business, maybe had run a marathon before. So that's not yeah. like somebody out of shape entirely. But what they had said is af, you know, like the first week was horrible. Yeah. But then all of a sudden he got in this rhythm where his body was like just simply capable of doing it. Yeah. Interesting. So I wonder if you just got to like break through this, this thing where you can't even think about how does somebody walk 30 miles a day minimum Yeah, with weight on the back through the mountains or the desert or it's not just flat road. Yeah. But I think if you just start doing it. <laughs> I mean, humans have amazing ability to just adapt to their situation. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, if you're doing this for long enough, you just, it just becomes normal. Yep. 
Uh, all right, so we are fast forwarding now to March 29th of 2017. This would be his eighth day. David took a day off from hiking to rest and enjoy Julian, which was at an elevation of about 4,226 feet. He wrote an email to his family. It's really nice. Every business here is locally owned. There's a cafe here that offers a slice of apple pie that weighs a whole one pound. Oh. I haven't tried it. I still eat normal amounts. This is a very <laughs> tiny town. Look at this. Like this is like the whole main town. Yeah. There's like a school outside here, but when you zoom out, it's. That's kind of funny. His comment about a slice of pie being a whole pound, I guess being from Ireland and from Europe in general, He's not accustomed to our um, he's plate not sizes. Not accustomed to Americans just eat a ton of food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, and it shows. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does. Um, all right, so now it is March. What we're going to do March thirtieth to April second, which would be days nine through twelve. Uh, David returned to the trail at miles seventy-seven and continued north, covering roughly seventy miles over the next four days. He would have passed through the town of Warner. Springs and portions of the Cleveland National Forest and Anza Borrego uh, Desert State Park, where the trail's ele- elevation tops at 5,500 feet. Another hiker, Daniel Windsor, who was on the trail at the same time as David and who blogged about his trek, described a storm uh, the night of March 31st that unleashed winds so strong they partially collapsed his tent and caused the rain to fall sideways. So, Safe to assume that David was probably hiking through some pretty nasty weather, can't trying to sleep through it uh, on the night of, or in between March 30th through April 2nd. So it is now April 3rd, 2017. This is the 13th day of his hike on the PCT. David stopped for lunch at a popular Paradise Valley caf- Cafe in Anza, about a mile off the trail, which is at an elevation of about 4,700 feet. The same PCT hiker, Daniel Windsor, blogged about eating with the badly sunburnt Dave from Ireland and seeing him catch a ride from the restaurant back to the trail. He'd hiked just over 150 miles by this point. So this is one of the things we talked about uh, when you're hiking in elevation or obviously desert. Yeah, uh, he didn't cover his skin. Didn't cover his skin uh, or and wasn't wearing sunscreen. But if you're sweating a lot, that sunscreen will burn off you pretty yeah, quick. Yeah, that's why you just got to cover your skin. Yeah. So Daniel Windsor in an interview said uh, in an interview after David's disappearance said David's incredibly bad sunburn is one thing that stands out in his memory and that how unprepared he seemed. So um, this guy who I was on his blog, he's got some pretty cool pictures from his hike. Um, He made the comment about how just not talking to him, that just kind of looking at him that he seemed unprepared so it's just an interesting observation. Yeah, of, we've seen all those people on the trail. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've seen people hiking in sandals and flip flops. Well, even the people that might have all the stuff. Yeah, but a you can tell the stuff is new. Yeah, <laughs> like you can tell that they. So it doesn't mean they're inexperienced, but typically, like I haven't bought a new bag in years. I uh, have, but I still have my original bag I use. Yeah, and you can just tell by how they carry themselves that they yeah. haven't done it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, Windsor goes on to say, I got, uh, I got kind of a general feeling he was kind of getting slapped around by being out on the trail, Windsor said. That's probably why I was trying to push him towards not trying anything he was not prepared for. Uh, Windsor felt like David had romanticized the PCT as a place to escape. Despite the rough reality, though, he said David's spirits were high. He writes, he didn't give any hints he wanted to quit or escape the trail, Windsor said. He wasn't miserable. So I think this is a good window into his mindset. I think when we get into theories, we can, you know, we can say that, you know. He he made it pretty far. I mean, here's the border. Yeah. So it's around here, basically. There's Mount Laguna. So he's he's done quite a bit of hiking. That's, you know, more than I've ever hiked in one in, in one trip. trip. Yeah, in one trip. I mean, for any other backcountry hike, <laughs> oh, that how would... how much farther he has to go. He's not even out of Southern California. Oh, my God. But, yeah. So I, like, want to do this, but look at that. He he did 150 this, miles of a 2,600-mile right trail. Yeah, he's, like, 1-30th of it, maybe. <laughs> and that's the funny, like, not funny part, but the amazing part is any other backcountry hike, that would be amazing. 150 yeah. miles in one trip. Yeah. But for the PCT, that's like nothing. Yeah, most I've done is like 65 miles. Over several, like a week or... 
uh, like four or five days. Yeah. But like that was gru- that was Grueling. gruesome. Yeah. Like this is doing twice that speed every day for two to three months for the fastest. Yeah. <laughs> Which I would not be the fastest. No. God. It would probably take me the full five months. Yeah. Um, so, all right, let's fast forward to, um, it's April 3rd to April 5th, which would be day 13 through 15 on David's hike. From Anza, David began to climb into the San Jacinto Mountains. Because of a wildfire four years earlier, a stretch of the PCT was closed just after mile 166, an elevation of about 6,000 feet. It's unknown what exact route uh, David took into Idlewild, but he arrived in town on April 5th. So an interesting thing when I was doing my research was there was a massive forest fire in this area back at this time period. And it took them several years to repair the trail so that people could start hiking it again. It was closed for a, a, an extended period of time. It's weird that a fire would <clears throat> make the trail unwalkable. I wonder like what that is because I, I usually assume that the fire coming through would actually clear stuff. We've been through the forest fire areas in Montana and they're open. Yeah. And I mean, so I was, it must've been so bad that for whatever I reason, I was in Yosemite and saw a lot of uh, areas that were burned. So I don't know exactly why they were closed, but hmm. yeah, it was closed because they were repairing the, the trails. So oh, maybe they just, we had so much work. They just diverted people around it. Yeah. So, all right. So it's April 5th, 2017. Now, like I said, he just arrived in a town He'd been hiking for two and a half weeks when he found himself in Idlewild, a small mountain town at the foot of the San Jacinto Mountain. Idlewild is a popular holiday spot, so he rented a room for two nights at the Idlewild Inn. Uh, He had been waiting for an adapter for his Kindle to arrive at the post office and was considering waiting until it opened um, the next day before setting off on his trip, but he was concerned that it may interfere with his schedule. It is not known whether he tried to pick up the adapter or not, but it is certain he never received it as it ended up back at the retailer. An email he sent on that very same morning would be the last communication he ever made. So uh, it's now April 6th, 2017 in the evening. David sent an email to his uh, family back in Ireland. He wrote, Idlewild is a great town to stay in for the day. The restaurants are tasty and cheap. Everyone's super friendly. Um, he had told his parents in an email the next day. Uh, he also wrote uh, from the Idlewild Library that he was taking the day off uh, to rest and do chores, such as resupplying his food and trying to get an adapter from Amazon so he could charge his tablet. Uh, on a trip to the post office, he signed the PCT trail register. He also messaged with a friend he planned to meet in Santa Barbara in about four weeks. He finally mentioned in the email that if his adapter hadn't arrived on April 6th, he might have to wait at the post office, like I said. Uh, This, and like I said before, this would be the last time the family would ever hear from him. So it is now the morning of April 7th, 2017. David checks out of the motel. Um, And this is the really interesting part. So he, like we said earlier, he had planned to maybe skip this section or he he planned to skip the Sierra Nevada section if the weather was too bad. But I don't know that he, he knew the conditions in the San Jacinto mountains were actually still pretty dangerous around this time. And a lot of comments online and Reddit and a lot of people say most of the problems on the PCT, as far as injuries and deaths seem to happen in the San Jacinto mountain area. Really? So it might just be that, they're prone to whatever the terrain is. It's causing all these bad issues, terrain, weather, but I actually have some trail reports from before he would have, uh, attempted to go through there and probably a few days after. So one trail report is from March 30th of 2017. And another trail report is from April 11th, 2017. And this is actually a really cool website. There's a guy who lives out there and he just hikes all over and then writes down these trail conditions on his website. Just all the time? All the time. I have a wow. link in our show notes. I'll show you after That's that. awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool. So, like I said, it's unclear if David continued through the San Jacinto Mountains or attempted another route, but based on his previous emails, it seems like he may have continued the PCT. So this is a trail report from March 30th of 2017. Snow along almost entire trail from Saddle Junction to Fuller Ridge Campground 
In many areas, snow is one to three feet deep with deeper drifts, largely clear around Strawberry. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. Sienga and Strawberry Junction. Many clear sections on Angel's Glide, Saddle Junction north to 9,000 feet crest. Note that almost all PCT trail posts above 8,000 feet and some junction signs are completely hidden under snow drifts, making navigation difficult. Uh, so now we have a... So this would have been the trail conditions from before he would have hit this part of the PCT. So now we have a trail condition report from April 11th, which presumably would have been what the trail was like after he would have already gone through there. Uh, so the trail report uh, goes on to say, snow along parts of the trail from Saddle Junction to Fuller Ridge Campground, largely clear from Saddle Junction to 9,000 foot crest, then continuous snow to State Park Boundary at Annie's Junction, clear from near that junction past Strawberry, uh, to Strawberry Junction, snow patches increasingly frequent from uh, north from Strawberry Junction, then snow largely continuous, one to three feet until Fuller Ridge Trail. Uh, turning, many PCT trail posts above 8,000 feet remain hidden under snowdrifts, making navigation somewhat difficult. So interestingly enough, uh, Joe, at the, in this time period, there were four other hikers that had to be rescued in March and April around this time period, according to the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit. All from that area. All from that area of okay. volunteer group that often assists. I, the, I'm not going to say anything. The local sheriff's <laughs> I'll department. save it. One was a PCT hiker who had fallen down a mountain near a campground at the northwest end of Fuller Ridge on March 30th. He'd lost all his water and his stove in the fall and had exhausted himself climbing back to the trail repeatedly, one rescuer wrote. On the way to get him, their own truck got stuck in the snow miles from the trailhead. So... The conditions in that area at the time David would have t attempted to, you know, hike the PCT were bad, especially bad for um, someone who had no experience hiking in those kinds of conditions. Yeah. So. Um, I'm actually surprised that they're getting snow this far south. Look at that. Look at where that is. Yeah. But I mean, we're talking elevations of I know. eight, 9,000 feet. Okay. But I, yeah. Okay. So, um, so now we're going to, so like we said, the, he, David's missing. Um, no one really knows what happened to him. It's now May, 2017. So we're going to kind of, we're going to get some quotes from his parents. Um, his mom, uh, whose name is Carmel O'Sullivan wrote, he had told us prior to leaving that he could have difficulty in keeping in touch on a regular basis and not to worry. His mother said, she goes on to say, we unfortunately took this to mean that weeks could pass without news. But by this time, so May 2017, his family began to get worried. They contacted police in Ireland and took to Facebook to ask if other PCT hikers had seen him. They also reached out to his bank and were told that his account was still active, according to his mother. The family uneasily went back to waiting for him to email. But the bank information turned out to be incorrect. The activity they saw was from scheduled payments and in reality had made no transactions since he was in Idlewild. So, um, interesting. Oh, that's too bad. Interesting bit of information there. So, this is Fuller Ridge. Okay. Yeah, there's some snow and there's up there. There's snow, yeah. Yep. And then look off in the desert. <laughs> I know. That, I mean, I, when we were in Hawaii on the top of Mauna Loa, we had uh, snow. Really? Not a ton of it, but there was snow up there. And you, when you're going to Hawaii, you don't think you're going to see snow. But it was, you know, over 10,000 feet. Oops, I just activated no selfie mode. <laughs> That's so, funny. All right, so we're going to fast forward to June 30th of 2017 now. So his family at this point finally filed a missing persons report. So this is, he went missing on, what we say, Joe, uh, April 7th. Yeah, roughly. Was his, the last contact, and the first missing persons report was uh, filed uh, June 30th of 2017. So, April, you know, almost three months after he potentially was last seen, which is oh, not that's not a good situation. Not ideal. So, like I had mentioned earlier, David had arranged to meet a friend in Santa Barbara in May, but he never turned up. His parents called the PCT Association back only to be told that they were not a babysitting service and that there was nothing they could do. So, um, Sounds like someone had a bad day. Yeah, someone had a bad day. So after hitting a dead end with the PCT Association, 
His family went back to the local police and contacted the Irish consulate in San Francisco. Their lack of knowledge about jurisdictions on a different continent convoluted the process of getting David reported missing in the U.S. As an Irish, an Irish, outreach, an Irish outreach group in San Diego got involved. It's now July 13th of 2017. So someone there talked to the owner of an Irish bar in Marietta, a Riverside County city 50 miles from Idlewild, who knew a local police officer who was also Irish. That officer, Sean uh, Lawyer, Lawler, sorry, entered David O'Sullivan into the state and federal missing persons database on July 13 of 2017, the day that he was contacted and alerted the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, which has jurisdiction in Idlewild. I think so, we're going to add Ireland to countries that we've upset with our pronunciation issues. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is uh, never good. We always say the first day or two is the most important in a missing persons case. So now we're talking, he was last seen on April 7th, and he was officially listed as a missing person on July 13th. So a lot of time has passed. And the search and rescue really didn't even get going until August because the, the sheriff's department in Idle, you know, in that area, they weren't even convinced that he was in their jurisdiction. So uh, they, they uh, yeah, yeah, like we don't know how far he traveled. Yeah, so and he was he was making decent distance, so that's yeah. a really big window. Yeah, so before the uh, sheriff's emergency response team organized her ground search, they asked the detectives bureau to develop some better information about David's activities in Idlewild. A sheriff's investigator spoke to people at a couple of places uh, David was known to have visited, but no one remembered remembered him out of the hundreds of hikers who come through town each year. Another investigator contacted a water district that operates a drinking fountain where the trail reaches the desert floor after a long, steep descent out of the mountains. Almost every PCT hiker stops here, and the district has surveillance cameras set up to discourage trespassers. An image of O'Sullivan uh, could have been confirmed uh, that he'd actually make, made it out of Idlewild. The investigator asked the district employee to review the footage, but they never got a response. So the investigators are hitting a dead end here. An investigator also tried to reach Amazon to see if O'Sullivan's Kindle could be tracked, but Amazon also didn't respond. So the investigators did talk to a couple people who had thought they had seen O'Sullivan at points north of Idlewild. One was a man in his early 60s named Dennis Neal, uh, who goes by the, the trail name Trail Angel. Uh, he's someone who gives hikers things like rides, food, water, or even a place to sleep, uh, who said he helped 100 to 150 people in 2017 following uh, PCT custom. Neil went by, oh, so he went by the nickname Hillbilly. So he went on to say that sometime between April 10th and April 15th, he remembered picking someone up at an exit along Interstate 10, which runs through the thin strip of low elevation desert that separates the San Jacinto in San Bernardino Mountains, uh, letting him uh, letting him rest at his home for a few hours and then driving him back, according to the sheriff's report. The person kept to himself, but Neil remembered the accent and told investigators he didn't meet any Irish people on the trail. So, Kathy Tarr... High probably, th they think that was him? Um, th they, you know, people think it might have been him. They think the guy who goes by Hillbilly may have misremembered. Um, okay. So uh, a woman named by, goes by the name of Kathy Tarr, who is leading an ongoing volunteer effort uh, to find David at the time, spoke to Neil before he died, uh, which he died in June 2018, and she thinks he was confused. She noted that there were people from 31 countries on the PCT that year, and ac accents could easily be mistaken. She's also collected a small photo gallery of 2017 hikers who look remarkably similar to David. She even has a picture that someone thought was uh, O'Sullivan with Neil, but the people in the photo are neither O'Sullivan or Neil. But Tara's team actually did make some headway in the investigation that the sheriff didn't. So they did tie up some loose ends. So Tara got in touch with Amazon and found that David's Kindle was last used April 5th, and it didn't have a GPS app, so it couldn't be tracked. The team also learned that the Desert Water Agency didn't have any photos of, from the water fountain, Tar said. So 
In late July and early August of 2017, the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit unit uh, volunteer group scouted a few areas ahead of a large-scale air and ground search that was going to happen in August. So let's fast forward now. It is uh, August 12th of 2017. So the Sheriff's Department initiated a large air and ground search operation that encompassed almost 20-mile stretch of the PCT from Fuller Ridge, which Joe showed on the, the screen here, a treacherous section that was still covered in snow and ice while David was there, to the Riverside County line in the desert just north of I-10. Despite the use of helicopters, dogs, ATVs, the search and rescue team came up with nothing. And with no evidence of foul play, there there was little in the way of official investigation after that point. Now, this we've seen in a lot of different uh, cases. You know, family and friends always say that, um, you know, sometimes they complain that search and rescue didn't do enough to try and search for their loved ones, and um, it wasn't any different in this case. Uh, Family and friends complained that they felt local law enforcement didn't spend enough time looking for David, but local residents of Idlewild say it's not that uncommon. So longtime Idlewild resident John King, who's a prolific uh, prolific hiker and a volunteer ranger with the search and rescue experience, uh, who also had helped during... Uh, David Search said, it sounds pretty typical that local authorities would call off a search after a few unsuccessful days. He goes on to say, if they can't find someone not alive and can't find them straight away by getting a ping off a cell phone or a GPS point, then the sheriff's department just gives up really quickly, he said. In David's case, when officials knew they were not looking for a live person in danger, King, King called the search superficial at best. So I think in this case, uh, the family may have had, uh, you know, their their anger or their you know frustration that the search ended too soon may have had some weight behind it based on, you know, what the local resident had said. But I can also see it from the law enforcement side. Yeah, uh, they have like a huge window of time. Yeah, he went missing early April. He officially was reported missing middle of July. Well, and it doesn't mean that he was missing in early April. That's the thing. It's he just didn't write any letters or anything like that. So maybe, you know, speculation could say he went missing right away because he was communicating so much. Yeah. But if he had just told them that there might be times where he doesn't communicate for a while. Yeah. I don't know. So, um, and obviously this isn't how all agencies treat recovery efforts. Um, It really... You know, obviously, with this sheriff's department, they're probably dealing with so many different, with how many people are coming through that area every year. Well, and the crime in Southern California, we hear about that all the time. Yeah, so like, um, oops, Uh, (laughs) sorry about that. Um, Their resources are probably stretched extremely thin. So, you know, like you said, it's like three and a half months, four months since when he was last seen. They're going to look, you know, like maybe they'll get lucky and a helicopter will pick something up or maybe they'll find remains, but they can't keep searching out there every day. And, and it does happen sometimes where searchers will get injured or killed in a search. So they got to be careful with, you know, their crew, uh, especially if the conditions are still pretty bad. So, um, and then, you know, after this point, there were several hikers that called in eyewitness statements thinking they may have seen David at some point on the trail but none of these sightings uh, have been positively ID'd. Uh, there, was, <laughs> there was one German guy who bared a striking resemblance to David on the trail, and it's possible that some people may have gotten confused uh, seeing him. So let's fast forward to August or October 12th of 2017. This is when law enforcement officially closed the case. So, at the, so they, they wrote um, in a post, at this time, there's no additional investigation, investigative leads. Investigator wrote in a report dated October 12, 2017. He goes on to say, no additional information has been received that would show O'Sullivan was in fact lost or missing along portions of the PCT within the department's jurisdiction or prove that O'Sullivan was in the Idlewild area. This case will be closed exceptional until further information is developed. Now, I was curious what exceptional meant. Yeah, it seems like it would be a typo. And so in a criminal case, closed exceptional means police believe they know who committed the crime, but some circumstance, for instance, the suspect dies, 
a victim won't cooperate or prosecutors decline a case prevents them from closing the case through an arrest. Sheriff's officials wouldn't explain what the phrase means in a non-criminal missing person case. So that's weird. It is a weird, uh, closed, exceptional. Hope if someone's listening, that's an investigator who works in law enforcement. Let us know what this guy might have meant by saying closed, exceptional. So, like I said, investigators were not completely convinced that David had gone missing in their jurisdiction due to the amount of time between last contact and when he was reported missing. The next jurisdiction north is San Bernardino County. The sheriff's department there never conducted any searches for O'Sullivan. A spokesperson said that was due. Uh, that was because the information they had received said that O'Sullivan was lost, last known in the location of Idlewild. So they're like, we're not going to search. He wasn't up in San Bernardino, but he could have made it that far. But so they didn't search. Uh, then just days after the case was closed, his parents, Carmel and Khan O'Sullivan, arrived for their first of three trips from Ireland. The Riverside County Sheriff's Department put on a presentation to show what they had done. Uh, Carmel said, they go on to say that was it. They said he might be found sometime in the next X number of years, possibly never. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. It's, it's They're a little jerks. Say, yeah, I mean, they... <laughs> like no sympathy or... That's kind of a... This is the first time we've dealt with when we've heard this type of reaction. Yeah, and I wonder if it's because they're not Americans. They're from, you know, a foreign country. But um, still. But still, yeah. The, these parents are reeling from their son going missing. Um, she goes on to say, or they, they, their second visit was in December. Only one detective met with them. No one was rude. Carmel said, but the O'Sullivan's felt encouraged to leave. <laughs> so, uh, they did tell them that if they were ever out there training, they would keep, uh, David in mind. So last little bit of the timeline here, uh, we're going to December of 2017. So in December of 2017, an aerial survey was con conducted over Idl Idlewild. The pilot Gus Calderon and a mission specialist, Richard McCrate, overflew 88 square miles of both mountain face and deep desert, taking over 1,000 photographs of the ground below. Volunteers analyzed those images in detail, looking for signs of David's blue backpack. Gus and Richard used software supplied by Aeroscientific to conduct the survey. Aeroscientific's flight planning software, flight planner, and management system, Aviatrix, were used to plan the flight runs over the Idlewild and manage the camera system throughout the flight. The area survey, survey successfully acquired 1,235 color images of the area at 4-inch resolution. That's pretty darn good. That is pretty darn good. Uh, on a regular basis, volunteers largely from San Diego's Irish community still scour the mountain on foot and on horses looking for any signs of David. Drones have been flown over grid by grid while people on the ground examine thousands of images for any clues. So, um, sadly... Uh, to this day, no, you know, five, what is it, 2017, five years later, no evidence or signs of David have ever been found. So.